My name is Jacob Bullock. I'm a senior software engineer and trainer at the Bigner Branch. I've been writing software for about 20 years. The last 10 or 11 focused primarily in the Apple ecosystem. But I'm not here to talk to you today about any of that. I come to you today as a human. I have more than 37 years of experience as a human. But sadly, I'm a much better software developer than I am a human. And that's because when I discovered software development, I knew, it was, it, I knew it was what I wanted to do. I wanted to be great at it. I tried to learn everything I could, and I struggled through a very painful learning process to be a good programmer. I still do that today. However, it wasn't really until my wife and I started having kids about 10 years ago that I started to appreciate what it means to be human what being a good human looks like, and more importantly, how to care for humans. Historically, I just sort of lived life based on the golden rule. It's so simple, the algorithm for world peace in one line of code. Maybe it's not the most optimized, but surely it's something we can all get on board with, right? Well, it turns out not exactly. Before becoming a parent, I never actually felt emotionally responsible for anybody. And I didn't appreciate how different personalities might require different tactics. I used to think that humans came out of the womb as a blank slate, and personality had more to do with nurturing and life experience than a person's actual nature. As I had more children, I learned I was very wrong about this. My whole opinions on nature versus nurture have completely inverted. While it's true we do think about things through the lens of our entire life experience, we tend to be born with our personalities pretty set. Science has proven that our genes actually play a role in more than just what we might look like, when we'll start balding, what color our eyes are, when our beards will turn gray, some of us. But our genes have a huge impact on our personalities as well. Each of these little humans that I'm responsible for has revealed their personalities very early on. More was revealed as they got older and they were able to communicate better. I realized that if I was going to be a good father to them, I needed to do more than just set rules and make sure they stepped in line. I was going to have to learn about them at a deep level, learn to love and care for them in the unique ways that they require, how to make them smile, how to correct bad behavior, how to comfort them when they're sad, and how to encourage each of them individually on their own paths. I have five children now, all girls ranging from five months to nine years, and a normal day in my house looks a little something like this. We homeschool, I work from home, so it's, it's a bit of a fire all day. But all five of these children have the same parents, and they couldn't be more different from each other. They have different needs, and they look at the world and experience it differently than each other. These past 10 years, I've learned a lot about being a human, and more importantly, how to care for humans, and that's what I'd like to discuss with you today. I hope to show how these lessons in fatherhood and being a husband at home I've tried to take with me into work relationships and every relationship. It's drastically changed me as a person and I hope it will inspire change in you as well. Human connection can actually be a very sensitive topic and I may say some things that you don't like, that you find offensive, but I'd encourage you to come talk with me after or ask questions at the end. This is a, the beginning of a much larger conversation I'd love for all of us to start having together. So why are we talking about this at a developer conference? Consider that before I was even allowed to submit this talk, I had to agree to a code of conduct. This is not unique to 360 iDev. It's become a very common thing to see codes of conduct popping up everywhere. Conferences, meetups, even if you want to contribute one line of code to an open source software project, you're going to have to agree to a certain behavior. These codes of conduct are often nice. It's a nice gesture to make a community feel safer, make them feel inclusive, and we should definitely be striving for that. However, they don't really address any of the real problems that, that have caused their need. They can actually be quite exclusionary by focusing on the punishment for bad behavior rather than, than focusing on a way to, to make the offense a teaching moment. Part of the reason these codes of conduct are popping up all over the place is that we live in a very polarized society. Ideology often seems to be all that matters. 
We don't see people as humans with feelings, sensitivities, and insecurities that share our same basic needs. We tend to see things that represent our interpretation, our worst interpretation, of their thoughts or actions. I could completely change the tone in this room with only a few words that might spark <coughs> outrage in some, but joy in others. <coughs> Humans are very tribal by nature. We want to feel like we belong somewhere. Belonging to a group is not a bad thing. It's actually a very good thing. We'll see throughout this talk how much we need community, how important it is for humans. It starts to go south when we look at those outside of our tribe as less than. We don't see them for who they are as people. We see them as members of some other tribe that we want nothing to do with. We as a nation, as humans, and even in the developer community have a problem. We've allowed tribalism to control us. We've become too dogmatic about virtually everything. It seems that if someone isn't part of the right tribe, they should be silenced, shamed, and even lose their ability to make a living. While it's very easy to see the faults of tribalism in something like politics, almost anything can be leading to divisive, hurtful interactions these days. I've seen cases where very well-respected developers' opinions on something like the merits of functional programming are completely disregarded because of their political ideology. I've seen people say the nastiest things to each other over disagreements about app architecture. You may have heard of the great MVC, MVVM war of the 21st century. I've watched TDD programmers publicly shame others for not following proper TDD protocols. We're not just fighting with other tribes, we're fighting amongst ourselves. Even people that agree with us, we're going to find disagreement with and argue with. I've heard outlandish arguments about tabs versus spaces. Now, some of these might sound trivial, and maybe we can all laugh at the idea that people are actually getting in heated debates about tabs versus spaces. I'm sure none of us in this room would engage in anything so childish. But what about more serious disagreements that might affect, that might affect you or those you work with more personally? What sets you off? What do you feel dogmatic about? What, what tribes are you part of? Who are you excluding? What prevents you from seeing the people around you as people and instead only seeing the worst interpretations of their thoughts or opinions or actions. What makes you want to go to war with the tribes around you? Instead of just writing off those outside of our tribes as irrational idiots, we need to start thinking about them a bit, a bit more empathetically. We need to give people time and space to allow new information to set root and how they think. We must also let them have room to join our tribe so that we can influence them and maybe, just maybe, they might influence our tribes. It's very difficult for someone to just change their mind on something, even with all of the information right in front of them. All of us in this room only think the way we do because of every experience in our life up to this moment in time. You could have new experiences over the next two weeks that will completely change the way you think and act for the rest of your life. We need to allow for the possibility that maybe we're wrong, Maybe we're the ones that need to change. We need to allow that we might just disagree with somebody and that's okay. Maybe there isn't ever an objectively better tribe. Even in cases where there is an objectively better tribe, we must learn to allow for that. We must learn to allow for people to just prefer something that's objectively worse. It might take years for them to see the errors in their thinking, but they will have to, they will have to come to that on their own. You can't force it on them. Where are my React Native devs, my React Native devs at? So you, you guys all know what I'm talking about. It takes years sometimes to, res to, to understand the error of your ways. There's a common misconception, certainly one that I was guilty of believing, that people tend to think through things logically all the time, that we have and will always be reasoned into our beliefs. If someone receives new information, they will immediately process it, and they can immediately, logically, change their mind in that moment. But that's not how humans process information. We are emotional creatures that rely heavily on past experience, and how that past experience made us feel, regardless of logic. We rely heavily on past experience to help us interpret new experience. We often interpret more emotionally without any logic or reason. 
Studies have proven that we will draw emotional conclusions first and then later try to rationalize with reason. Even when we are unable to do so, we cannot rationalize our position. We will stay rooted in that emotional conclusion because of how we feel about it. Jonathan Haidt, in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, helps us understand this process through a simple metaphor. Imagine a person riding an elephant on a path. The rider represents our logic and reason, and the elephant represents our emotional and automatic processes, the emotions and things that we are not really aware of. The rider is able to guide the elephant on this path, but only when the elephant allows it to do so. I talks about this detail, or sorry, this metaphor, and how we commonly make the mistake to appeal to the rider first. This is a mistake because the rider can't actually control the elephant in any meaningful ways unless the elephant has allowed it to do so. <clears throat> if the elephant has already made a decision about where it wants to go, the rider has virtually no control or, or influence over the elephant. The rider can't just stop the elephant in its tracks or turn the elephant around. <clears throat> it can't stop it from stampeding off into some, some direction if it feels scared. The rider may be able to nudge or influence over time, and maybe the elephant will listen to the rider if it trusts it enough. However, the elephant can easily turn itself around if it so desires. It can choose to stop stampeding when it feels safe, and an elephant will not stop when it is still an elephant will not stop when it's still in fear. So you can't just tell somebody to stop feeling a particular way. They need to feel safe that it's okay for them to stop and reassess what's going on. The elephant can allow the rider to guide them through life on this path or choose to completely ignore them so they don't have to have any input from the rider at all. We often try to appeal to the rider first because it's easy to engage with reason and facts. It's much more difficult to appeal to the elephant. The 13,000 pound metaphor of our entire lifetime of experience, both good and bad. The elephant represents the culture that we were raised in how we were treated as babies and throughout childhood, the emotional baggage of past relationships, past traumas, past hurts, past jobs, past successes, past failures. If someone comes to a conclusion emotionally, it is virtually impossible to change their mind using logic and reason. You can't reason someone out of something that they were never reasoned into. If you want to persuade or influence someone, you must learn to understand them at a much deeper level. You must learn to empathize with them. You must learn what brings them joy, understand what makes them afraid and sad. And then you can speak to their metaphorical elephant. It really shouldn't surprise any of us that this is true. We're all far more likely to listen to someone that has shown evidence that they care about us or understand how we need to be loved and cared for. But it is not often enough that we pursue being this person for somebody else. We don't often try to influence people in this way. We cherish when it happens to us, but it requires intentionality to be this for somebody else. And it requires you to risk a part of yourself, <clears throat> and so it, it's very risky. We all have the same basic needs. We need water, we need food, we need sun, and we need shelter from it. It's typically very easy to feel these needs and be aware of them. We all know what hunger pains feel like. We know what dry mouth feels like when we need water. We know what it feels like to be inside for hours and never see the sun while we're finishing deadlines and be desperate to get out there again. Only to realize that the sun's actually pretty brutal sometimes and shelter with AC is actually pretty great too. Beyond these, we also desperately need human connection. There's been fascinating research around this. Scientists and psychologists have discovered that problems like drug abuse, drug addiction, and depression have significantly more to do with a lack of human connection and community than they do with chemical hooks and narcotics <clears throat> or a hormonal imbalance. However, this need for human connection is not obvious like other needs. It doesn't manifest itself in obvious ways. It's not easily satiated by a Snickers bar. It often manifests itself in much less obvious ways. And while we may realize we need that connection, it can be very risky to connect with humans because we're often forced to expose vulnerabilities to do so. To better connect with someone else can be really hard work. 
And so it can be easily dismissed as unimportant or something you just don't want to deal with. We're all busy with various aspects of life, and no one is looking to add more drama or more sadness and hurt into their own life. Today, it's easy for us to fake connection through social media and online activities. Even though we are more connected than we have ever been throughout history, study after study shows that we as humans feel lonelier and disconnected, more disconnected than ever before. The internet is perhaps the most amazing tool ever created for connecting with your tribe, but it is a terrible tool for connecting with humans. Human connection is hard. It requires you to be very intentional. It requires you to be vulnerable. It requires you to risk part of yourself, and it requires you to give grace to people that don't deserve it. More importantly, it requires you to ask for grace when you don't deserve it. Your survival instincts can kick in and make you forget all about the well-being of, the well-being of others. It's tricky business, but I'd like to take a look at some strategies that we can all employ every day to help us better interact with the humans around us. I've mentioned this a couple times so far, but I want to focus on empathy for a minute. It's probably the most important of these skills, and everything else will branch off of this idea. Mike touched on this a little bit this morning in the keynote. Empathy is the ability to experience the feelings of another person. It goes beyond sympathy, which is caring and acknowledging that other people are suffering or how they're feeling. Both words are often used similarly and interchangeably, but they differ in their emotional meanings. Sympathy is simply your ability to recognize that someone is going through something. Empathy is your ability to actually feel the same feelings. That may be because you have actual experience with the same type of thing and you can re relate directly to that specific experience. Or you might be able to draw on past experiences that are similar, and so you can imagine what it might be like to be in that person's shoes. You may have no past experience whatsoever, but as you learn to develop empathy, you might learn to imagine what that pain must be like for somebody. I'm willing to bet that most of you, maybe none of you have ever broken your leg before, I haven't, but I bet this image makes you cringe a little bit. As you might imagine what that goalkeeper is going through, you're not just acknowledging that his leg is broken and that he's probably feeling pain. You likely tense up a little seeing an image like that. Sorry for anybody who's got a broken bone thing. You can consider what that pain would be like. That ability to feel somebody else's pain is empathy. This is one of the most important emotional skills, and you should take every opportunity to, to improve upon it. This skill will increase your ability to appeal directly to somebody's elephant. One tool that I find particularly helpful for developing empathy is the Enneagram. Enneagram, like every other word in English, is made up of two Greek words. Enea meaning nine, and gramma meaning something written or drawn. The Enneagram is described as a powerful tool for personal and collect collective transformation. The nine points, aside from forming a very pagan looking symbol, represent nine distinct strategies for relating to yourself, others, and the world around you. It, speak to, it speaks to what drives each personality, what their fears and stresses are, what brings them joy, and how they respond to those feelings. What a person will tend to do in both stress and growth. The Enneagram has really helped me understand a great deal more about people that I've known my entire life. Things I never understood became so clear as I was better understood. I was able to better understand the driving forces behind their personalities. We don't all experience the world around us in the same way. If you know anything about this, I'll tell you I'm a hard seven with an eight wing. I found it particularly hilarious and kind of creepy reading the description of a seven. It was spot on for me. I encourage you to look into this and to see where you land and consider where your coworkers, friends, or life partners land. See if you can better empathize with them and how they process things, now that you have a better understanding of their personality, but also the emotional elephant that's controlling them. Before you can really develop empathy, you must know and understand yourself. 
Socrates said that people make themselves appear ridiculous when they try to know obscure things before they know themselves. Plato, a student of Socrates, believed that understanding oneself would enable them to have a better understanding of those around them. It's important to take an honest assessment of who you are, learn what makes you tick, what are your passions, what are the things you love, what are the things you hate. Be aware of what causes you to put up walls around you and keep you distant from the people you work with, especially those you interact with every day. It's not as easy as you might think. Thales, another Greek philosopher, said the most difficult thing in life is to know yourself. Are you easily offended if someone has critical feedback during PR review? Do you suffer from imposter syndrome and you just know that everybody knows you're a fraud? How do you react when you feel like you aren't being heard or understood? We are often our biggest critics, and we can be very hard on ourselves, much harder than others would ever be. But it's very easy to interpret somebody else's actions as, they are, though, as though they are using the same critical voice that we speak to ourselves with. It's important not to project that voice and project your ideas of inadequacy onto others. If you think of yourself negatively and someone ribs you about some minor slip up, you may take that as a serious criticism rather than an innocent joke. You might not be able to laugh at yourself and have fun. Be mindful of these things so that you can be more aware when your elephant is taking over and you're no longer able to be reasoned with. You should strive to be honest, to always tell the truth. Even when it is difficult to be honest, we often don't want to deal with the discomfort of what honesty brings. But honesty reveals a strength of your character, and it will strengthen the connections to the people that you're honest with. If we are all honest with ourselves, we, we would probably much prefer to get honest feedback from people so that we can grow and actually improve our life as humans. We don't want to get built up with some false sense of security as people lie to us about our, our, achievement, our achievements. It's very important to be tactful when speaking uncomfortable truths. Consider your words carefully and consider how your words might affect the person. Consider how you might feel if you were on the receiving end of these truths. In the book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, Jordan Peterson offers this advice. Tell the truth, or at least don't lie. Lying makes you weak, and it weakens your connections to the people around you. Lies tend to lead to, bigger, to, to more and bigger lies. They force you to keep track of dishonest memories that actually manipulate your ability to recall events. Lying becomes habitual, and it's a very difficult habit to break. Now, don't become so honest that you start becoming honest for other people. That's called gossip. If you know someone is lying, you should call them out privately and give them an opportunity to correct this on their own. We've talked about this a bit when talking about knowing ourselves, but it's important not to live in the past. Your brain desperately wants to protect you from bad experiences. It has an amazing ability to recall and fill in the gaps of every experience you have. It relies heavily on this ability to recall to interpret new experiences. And this can be very dangerous because it can, it can sometimes make you see brand new experiences in the same light as you've seen past bad experiences. Maybe at your last job there was a real jerk who was always mean to you and often critical of your code during PR review. You might have even left that place because you didn't like the way you were treated. And now at a new job, there's a different person who might have some critical feedback on your PR. And all of a sudden, you see them as though they're the same jerk from your past job. You must be aware when you're starting to project these bad experiences onto new ones. Be mindful not to think that someone is treating you a particular way simply because somebody else has done that to you in the past. Don't dismiss critical feedback because it's coming from a jerk. Still listen and hear and maybe take those things in and allow them to change to change you. Learn to acknowledge, appreciate, and celebrate what others do. Your survival instincts that cause you to strive to stay employed so that you can afford food and water and shelter, they can get in the way of you experiencing joy when other people succeed. We often long for all the praise or notice ourselves. 
We know how good it feels to receive that praise, but we don't often offer it so readily. We can even minimize the success and accomplishments of others as we compare them to ourselves. And this is very destructive because it breaks our ability to connect with those people. It prevents you from empathizing happy feelings. Buddhism teaches the virtue of mudita, finding joy in the happiness and success of others. You should aim to create a, a culture at work that celebrates the people there. At Big Nerd Ranch, our busiest Slack channel is called Thanks. And it's just a place for people to show appreciation and celebrate what others are doing throughout the company. You can be happy for the person who got a promotion over you. You can be excited for someone who gets singled out for praise on a project even when you feel like you work equally hard to finish it. It's perhaps one of the most difficult things to do, but it can be done and you should be striving to do it. Find excuses to celebrate what others have done even when you may feel worthy of that praise. Remember that empathy is not just your ability to feel someone's pain, but to, to feel the entire spectrum of emotions with them. <clears throat> Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt wrote a fantastic art or article that they later expounded on in a book called The Coddling of the American Mind. Among other things, their research discusses a number of cognitive distortions that lead people to being overly sensitive and easily offended and the negative outcomes of that behavior. The book focuses on the current climate of universities in the United States and how college students are being taught to be scared of ideas and words. How they aim to avoid exposure to any thought that might elicit strong emotional reactions by demanding so-called trigger warnings. Even more, they want to ban people from coming to their campuses if those people do not share their same ideologies, if they're not part of their tribe. Often accusing of them of committing microaggressions, seemingly insignificant actions or words that might have no malicious intent but are perceived as actual violence nonetheless. The idea that we should avoid things that we are scare scared of is counter to everything we know about fear processing. According to the most basic tenets of psych psychology, the very idea of helping people with anxiety disorders avoid the things they're scared of only makes them more scared of whatever that is. We must learn not to be scared of words and ideas. Certainly some words are hurtful, offensive even. Some ideas are terrible and they should never be practiced. But we can't be scared of their very existence. When a terrible idea manifests itself into offensive spoken word, raging against it doesn't actually make it go away. Be mindful about, about what it is about these words or ideas that incite these strong reactions in you. Don't allow, don't allow yourself to be outraged. Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher, wrote, It doesn't hurt me unless I interpret its happening as harmful to me. I can choose not to. You must learn to control how to react to challenging concepts, to not allow words to throw you off, don't be scared of ideas, even really scary ones. A great philosopher long ago in a galaxy far, far away once said, Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. Don't let your emotions prevent you from exploring new territory. You will not grow if you're not stretching and challenging yourself and your own ideas. You should look for opportunity to take in information that you know will contradict you and your own beliefs so that you can be challenged and grow. So you can learn to better empathize with people that don't agree with you. <clears throat> in his book, Clandestine Relationships, A Black Man's Odyssey in the Ku Klux Klan, Daryl Davis discusses his journey befriending members of the KKK. Through conversations and friendship, Davis directly influenced more than 50 people to rethink their racist ideas and as a result, leave the KKK. Davis is not a psychologist or researcher. He was a musician by trade that didn't understand how one, one human could hate another simply because of the color of their skin. And so he set out on a journey to better understand the people behind the hate. He reached out to a local leader of the KKK, Roger Kelly, and asked to meet with him to discuss some things. He left out the fact that he was a black man, I think for obvious reasons. They eventually met and they became friends. Roger Kelly 
once said about Davis at an actual Klan rally, a lot of times we don't agree with everything, but at least he respects me to sit down with me, and I respect him to sit down and listen to him. Roger Kelly eventually left the Klan and gave Davis all of his KKK paraphernalia on his way out. Davis now has a collection of clan robes and hoods that people have given him as they've left their racist tribe behind them. As a result of this approach, hundreds more have left that group, and their elephant is now walking on a different path. Davis entered into a very uncomfortable place to challenge their beliefs. He chose not to interpret harm, but he understood how to connect with them as people. He said, take time to sit down and talk with your adversaries. You will learn something, and they will learn something from you. It's when talking ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So keep the conversation going. Communicating well is paramount to deep human connection. The interesting thing is that the actual words used are often much less important than how the words are used. And how they make the person feel. People may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. The Gottman Institute, led by John Gottman, has done an amazing amount of research on relationships and communication over the past 40 years. They've studied and surveyed thousands of couples, and John Gottman has been able to predict if couples will stay together with over 90% accuracy based solely on how they communicate with each other. He's identified these negative communication patterns to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse for any relationship. Criticism, often in the form of ad hominem attacks, make the victim typically feel assaulted, rejected, and hurt. It causes the perpetrator and victim to fall into escalating patterns of criticism, which eventually leads to contempt. Contempt we show when we treat others disrespectfully. We mock them with sarcasm, ridicule, call them names, mimic or use body language such as rolling our eyes or scoffing. The targets of contempt are often meant, felt to feel despised and worthless. Contempt and criticism lead to defensiveness. We've probably all been defensive at some point. When we feel unjustly accused, we fish for excuses and play innocent victims so the perpetrator will just back off. And finally, stonewalling. Rather than confronting the issues with the person, people who stonewall can make evasive maneuvers such as tuning out, turning away, or engaging in obsessive or distracting behaviors. We should avoid these unhealthy patterns as best we can. All of these are detrimental to our ability to connect with those around us. The other side of communication is our ability to listen. Listen is not the same, listening is not the same as hearing. It's easy to hear the noise that comes out of someone's mouth, but listening requires more of you. It requires you to shut your own mouth and attentively listen to the person speaking. Try to understand what they're saying through the lens of their life experience. This technique is called active listening. It's commonly used in counseling, training, and conflict resolution. It requires that the, the listener fully concentrate, understand, and respond, and more importantly, remember what is actually being said. This means that the listener is not to stop the speaker or interrupt, but allow them to finish their thoughts. Don't get lost in your own ideas as you're working in preparation for your rebuttal to what they're saying. Likewise, the speaker must give the listener time to process what's being said and give them time and space to respond. It's often helpful to integrate reflective listening strategies as well. Reflection is where the listener actually repeats back to the speaker what they just heard. And this allows the speaker a chance to confirm that the listener is hearing them correctly. This can be particularly useful when the listener may be twisting words of the speaker in their mind. When they repeat back what they're hearing, that twisted narrative will often reveal itself. The proper use of this technique can help avoid misunderstandings, resolve conflict, get people to open up and build trust. All of these things are vital to our human connection. We all make mistakes. However, we typically judge other people's mistakes much differently than our own. Being blind to this double standard is actually very detrimental to our teamwork, building effective relationships, and it will negatively impact your ability to lead or collaborate on teams. When we make mistakes, we often blame the circumstances of the situation rather than take responsibility of the mistake. 
Don't dismiss your mistakes, but acknowledge what of your actions may have contributed to the mistake and accept responsibility for it. Project leaders should be inclined to do this in a very observable way to encourage other people to do the same. We should be creating a culture at work that allows for people to make mistakes graciously. Accepting responsibility for your own mistakes builds trust with your team and makes them feel safe to do the same. Owning your mistakes is evidence of a strong character. Have the courage to admit when you're wrong and do your best to make it right. Don't make a larger mistake by trying to conceal mistakes that you've made or lying about your own involvement. It's very easy to give ourselves grace when we make mistakes. It's not so easy to do that for others. The collaborative way offers this insight. When other people make mistakes, we tend to overemphasize the other person's role in that mistake. We very quickly blame them. As a result, we tend to assume that their personalities, their character, their values have led to their mistakes. We don't, ex we don't make excuses for them or minimize their involvement like we would do for ourselves. Once these conclusions arise, we tend to act as if that's the reality. This double standard is very well documented, and it's called the fundamental attribution error. This behavior can be countered through one very simple cognitive shift. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Assume that the person has had positive intentions. Identify the details of the situation and try to see the bigger picture. Slow down and allow time for this, especially if you're starting to perceive malicious intent. When you look for positive intent, you give the person a chance, you give yourself, sorry, the chance to absorb details of the entire situation. You may be surprised how often you learn something that you hadn't expected. You'll likely avoid many uncomfortable conversations and dam damaging conversations. It can be a good idea to imagine different ways that someone may have meant what they said and then try to filter what they're saying through the least offensive one. Assuming positive intent makes it easier for the other person to engage in productive conversation rather than getting defensive, one of those four horsemen we just talked about. And you'll be able to work together more effectively to deal with any situation that comes up. Now, rarely you will probably learn that someone did have malicious intent at some point. We are not perfect at all, after all. But don't, don't ever jump to this conclusion allow time for evidence to be revealed, and then you can actually take action on clear and verified information. This is especially important when you're working remotely with people and much of the communication happens in tools like Slack. It's very hard to detect tone and intention over text, and so it's easy to make bad assumptions of the person's intent. If we always assume positive intent, text-based conversation becomes a lot less volatile. If you believe someone has acted inappropriately or someone has made a complaint about someone else's behavior to you as a manager, you must give that person an opportunity to make things right. Give them an opportunity to own their mistakes. Even in the cases where you know the action or intent was malicious, that person should still be given a gracious opportunity to make amends. I recommend that the one who feels slighted go directly to the person or persons and talk to them directly about the situation. That can be understandably very difficult for some people. Confrontation can be very awkward. If you're not comfortable doing that, you should take a friend, coworker, or superior and go together and confront that person. It's important when confronting someone to come with tangible examples that they can see in context. Don't go to the person with vague accusations about, I didn't like what you said back there. Be specific, be clear, and provide actionable feedback. Give them time to absorb the information and encourage them to make things right with the person or persons that they may have hurt. Faceless accusations should not be allowed, save for a few exceptions, particularly around personal safety. We should be given an opportunity to face the person that we've offended and a path to redemption should be made clear. This allows both sides to hear each other out and better understand where each other is coming from. And finally, be nice. All of these strategies boil down to this simple idea. We're back to that golden rule, but hopefully with a little bit more depth. Remember that you cannot control how anyone acts in a given situation, except for yourself. You're the only one in control of your faculties, and you can make the choice to be nice, even in difficult situations. 
This requires you to really rein in that elephant, so it can be very difficult to do. But you have nothing to lose by being nice to someone. You might have everything to gain, though. You can set the tone wherever you are just by being nice, even to the most difficult people, even to the rudest people. When you lose control and start to get angry, every situation becomes more difficult to navigate. Imagine yourself on your worst day and how you would hope to be treated by those closest to you. Aim to be that person for those around you. It will not be easy, you'll likely get hurt, but don't let that taint a future opportunity to care for the humans around you. Be nice to everybody. You might just change the vector of their day. I hope this talk has given you some tools to make you better understand yourself and those around you. Regardless of where you are in this industry, you have the ability to make an impact in the lives of those around you and encourage everyone you interact with to be better. You can help a family member, a coworker, a friend, a manager, or a client with more than just great app development. You can provide something they long for most. There is no app that satisfies our need for human connection. So put your phones down. Start reconnecting with the humans next to you in a more intentional way. Look for opportunities to go deeper with existing relationships. Talk about things you love. Talk about things you hate. Aspirations. Be open and be vulnerable. By giving more of yourself to others, you may find more of yourself than you ever knew existed. Thanks so much. I appreciate your time and attentiveness to all this. Uh, I'd love to continue having this conversation over the next couple days, or you guys can reach me here. Uh, I did get rid of all my social media at the end of last year, so email's great, and uh, company Slack is great as well. And while most of these slides are not particularly helpful, I will upload them as well as a list of resources that I've mentioned throughout the talk. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for comments or questions.